octopus. I had to run get them. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and get started. So today I wanted to uh, complete our discussion of relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. Um, in particular, I wanted to finish up our discussion of the Dirac equation. So uh, let me just remind you of where we left off last lecture. So we were looking for the analog of the non-relativistic uh, Schrodinger equation. So uh, I h bar uh, psi dot is equal to h psi for uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. And in particular, what we wanted to do is replace the non-relativistic formula for the Hamiltonian being 1 over 2m times p squared with the relativistic formula so that e is the square root of m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. Okay. Now, if we just naively write an equation uh, for a particle uh, that uses a Hamiltonian, which is the square root of m squared plus p squared, where p is our differential operator, uh, we run into all sorts of problems. Okay, we found that it's possible to uh, send particles backwards in time uh, and all sorts of uh, other uh, sort of unpleasant things. So instead, the avenue uh, that we'd like to try and pursue today is to get rid of the square root by finding a Hilbert space for which the quantity appearing in the square root is a perfect square. So c squared p squared plus m squared c to the fourth is equal to the square of some operator that will be something linear in p plus something else linear in mass. Now, of course, if the alpha and beta appearing in this equation were just uh, regular old numbers instead of operators, then this would be impossible. Okay c squared p squared plus m squared c to the fourth is not a perfect square. However, what we saw is that if we assume that alpha and beta are not numbers, but rather matrices, then it is possible to uh, have uh, this quantity in the square root be a perfect square so that you could identify the energy with c times alpha dot p plus beta mc squared and then you could go ahead and interpret p as your usual differential operator minus i h bar uh, times d by dx. And then you would have a nice uh, uh, relativistic version of Schrodinger's equation, which has the property that the right-hand side of Schrodinger's equation would be linear in spatial derivatives rather than some funny square root, which led to all of the problems uh, in our attempts to form a relativistic theory of uh, quantum mechanics. So we saw last class that in order to satisfy this, alpha and beta must uh, obey uh, certain relationships. So alpha and beta must obey what is known as the Clifford algebra. So in particular, they all must anti-commute with one another, and they must square to one. And one can see that just by expanding out this square here and setting it equal to the left-hand side. And so um, what I claimed for you last time is this constrains the possible Hilbert spaces that we could be talking about here. So it's just a uh, fact, uh, one which is actually uh, rather easy to prove, that the smallest matrices 
for which these, uh, these uh, equations can be solved are four by four matrices. And in this case, up to conjugation by some unitary operators, that is to say up to some change of basis for your Hilbert space, alpha and beta are determined uniquely. They're the four by four matrices. Uh, so beta is basically um, a four by four matrix analog of sigma z, the third poly matrix. Um, so one and minus one here are the two, is the two, one here is the two by two identity matrix. And sigma here denotes the three poly matrices. So I'm writing these four by four matrices in two by two block diagonal form. Okay, so um, that leads us to our relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation, which is known as the Dirac equation. So I h bar d by dt of psi is equal to c times alpha dot p plus beta mc squared times psi, where psi is a uh, column vector, so a four component column vector, so that it can be acted on by these matrices alpha and beta, uh, which is referred to as a Dirac spinner. So previously in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you use the word spinner to refer to the two component column vector describing a particle with spin one half. One of the things that we learned when we discussed the representations of the Lorentz group is that there are in fact many different things that you could think about as particles with spin in special relativity. And so we often refer to them as different sorts of spinners, Dirac spinners, Majorana spinners, and so forth, okay. In this class, we'll only be talking about uh, this four component column vector known as a Dirac spinner. And one of my goals today is to make contact with your non-relativistic non notions of particles with spin um, uh, by taking a non-relativistic limit of the, the Dirac equation and seeing if we can understand that. Okay. And so in fact, um, just to uh, uh, touch base with our previous discussion of uh, the representations of the Lorentz group. Let me remind you that um, the Lorentz group, the set of symmetries in special relativity, was basically two copies of the uh, rotation group. And if you, that means that if you want to specify a uh, representation of the Lorentz group, that is to say a Hilbert space on which the Lorentz transformations act by unitary operators, then you need to specify two values of the spin. And the Dirac spinner is precisely the one where uh, you have two spin one half representations. Okay. So in the language that we used, it is the uh, one half comma one half representation of the Lorentz group. That's just a bit of mathematical terminology uh, that won't actually be uh, too important for what I'll be discussing later on in this course, later on in this class. Okay. And the important point is that, and this is just a fact of nature, is that it is the equation that describes the dynamics of a free particle with spin one half uh, such as an electron. Now, of course, uh, electrons also have various sorts of interactions, so one would have to modify the Dirac equation to take that into account. Um, and in that case, uh, in those more sophisticated uh, systems, the equations would be more complicated. But if you're just studying free electrons, then this is it. Okay. This is the equation that you would need uh, to study. So um, 
What I'd like to do now is just work through a little bit um, some of the features and implications of this equation. But before I do so, uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions. No questions? OK. So first, um, let's talk about uh, the symmetries of the Dirac equation. Okay. So I've been trying to, uh, I argued for you before, or I, I claimed for you before, that the Dirac equation describes a particle with spin. And in order to understand why that is, um, we should investigate how this Dirac equation behaves under rotation symmetry. Okay. If you want to see that this describes a particle with spin, then you'll need to understand how it acts under a rotation. And in particular, that will allow us to understand why it is that the Dirac equation describes a spin one-half particle. So our Hamiltonian here is the speed of light times alpha dot p plus beta mc squared, where alpha and beta are the four by four matrices made up of the three Pauli matrices and the identity matrix arranged in block diagonal form as I described earlier. And so it's this Hamiltonian should describe a system with rotation invariance, which means that this Hamiltonian should commute with the generator of rotations J. And what is the generator of rotations? Well, there are two types of angular momentum that an object can have. It can have intrinsic or orbital angular momentum and it can have, sorry, it can have uh, orbital angular momentum or intrinsic angular momentum, that is to say spin. Okay. So orbital angular momentum is easy to understand. So that's just generated by the usual operator x cross p. And so in order to understand what that spin operator s is, Let's first ask what happens when we try and investigate the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the generator of orbital angular momentum. So what is that? Well, beta mc squared obviously uh, is just a number. OK, so that commutes with everything. So this is the commutator of uh, here. Just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use units where c is equal to 1. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll never remember anything. OK. I'll use units where h bar is equal to 1 either. Because I can never remember where all of the c's, goes, c's go uh, in these expressions. <coughs> so I'll just drop the factor of c. And the commutator of the Hamiltonian with angular momentum is the commutator of alpha dot p with x cross p. So in order to work that out, let me, instead of using vector notation, use index notation. Okay. So I'll let i be an index that runs from 1 to 3. That denotes the spatial index. And I'll use my usual Einstein summation notation. So here. Um, the cross product of x and p is just the epsilon symbol, epsilon ijk, times xj pk. And so you can then expand out that commutator. The only thing that you have to worry about is the commutator of pl with xj. Which, of course, is just i i h bar, but I guess I'm using, I'll use units where h bar is equal to 1, times the delta function that sets l equals to j. So that's uh, 
There's, and there's a minus sign because the P comes before the X rather than afterwards. So what is that? That's alpha L epsilon I L K P K. Or another way of saying that is that the commutator of H with the vector L is minus I times the cross product of alpha with P. And in particular, we see that this is not equal to zero. So in order for the Hamiltonian to commute with the generator of angular momentum, it's necessary for the intrinsic angular momentum here, or the intrinsic spin of the object described by the Dirac equation to be non-zero. So what we need to do then is determine what that operator S is whose commutator with H will be precisely so that angular momentum is conserved. So indeed, uh, we can figure out exactly what that is just by playing around a little bit with uh, the Pauli matrices. So to see how that works, let's just consider the four by four matrix or the set of three four by four matrices where we just assemble the two Pauli matrices together into a four by four matrix. Okay. And alpha is zero sigma, sorry, zero sigma, sigma zero. So you can see there that because the Pauli matrices don't, don't commute with one another, but rather obey the angular momentum algebra, the commutator of sigma and alpha is going to be uh, not equal to zero. And in particular, the commutator of alpha with sigma is going to be um, another Pauli matrix. Okay. So the commutator of sigma with alpha, well, let's write it this way. In index notation, the commutator of sigma i with alpha j is going to be epsilon i j k times uh, alpha k with a factor of 2i uh, coming from uh, just the fact that the commutator of two Pauli matrices is 2i times epsilon i j k times another Pauli matrix. So that means that the commutator of alpha dot p, which is, uh, let's just use an index here with sigma i, is going to be um, 2 i epsilon i j k alpha k times uh, p j, otherwise known as 2 i minus 2 i times alpha cross p. Did I make a sign mistake here? Yeah, I think there might be a minus sign here. Okay. Like I always say, I have a PhD, so I don't have to keep track of minus signs. Um, I know it's the end of the semester because that joke didn't even get a laugh, which means I must have used it at least twice before. Okay, so there's, I think, a plus sign there. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that although H does not commute with the orbital angular momentum, if we define the total angular momentum, to be L plus S, where S is equal to H bar over two. Okay, I guess I'm sitting H bar equals to one, so it would just be one half times that matrix there. Then this is the quantity which commutes with the Hamiltonian, and so this is the generator of rotations. And if you stare at S for a minute, you'll remember that S equals to H bar over two times the Pauli matrix is precisely the generator of rotations for a spin one half particle 
in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So this tells you that the Dirac equation specified is indeed describing a particle which is transforming with spin one half under rotations. The only subtlety here is that it actually looks like it's two particles uh, transforming with spin one half rather than just one particle because I have a four by four matrix with two poly matrices in it rather than one poly matrix. Okay. If you were very bold, you could say that we could give names to those two particles. You could call one of them an electron and the other a positron. Okay. But um, the exact interpretation of this is something that I'll get to in a minute. So it's a little more subtle than that. But before I go on, let me just pause and see if there are any questions. OK. So let's begin by investigating the solutions to the Dirac equation. Which, again, I remind you, is I uh, h bar d by dt. OK, I'm going to keep using my units where c and h bar are equal to 1. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the Dirac equation is I h bar d by dt of psi is equal to c times alpha dot b plus beta m times c squared acting on psi. Okay. All set? Where, uh, again, uh, beta is the matrix 1 minus 1 and alpha is 0 sigma sigma 0. So this is a wave equation describing a free particle. Okay. So it should be pretty easy to solve. Okay. In order to understand what its solutions look like, let's remember that when we describe a particle without spin, a free particle without spin, its solutions take the form of plane waves. So a natural guess would be that psi should have some sort of plane wave type solution. So let's just investigate solutions of the form psi being some function of a vector p times the plane wave e to the i p dot x minus e t. So here we're just going to guess that psi is some sort of plane wave. And omega here is going to be some sort of column vector. And because I'm arranging my matrices alpha and beta in terms of two by block matrices, each entry of which is a two by two matrix, I'll write omega as a four component column vector made up of two two component column vectors that I'll call chi and phi uh, sitting on top of one another. And then the Dirac equation is just a statement that E acting on omega from the left-hand side of the Dirac equation, that's I d by dt of psi, you pull down a factor of minus IE by taking the time derivative and you multiply it by this plus I over here. So E times psi will be equal to alpha dot p plus beta m acting on psi. And psi is just omega times that phase factor. I can cancel the phase factor on both sides. Or I can write this out a little bit more explicitly in terms of the 2 by 2 Pauli matrices as, um, well, just moving this guy over to the other side. So E, so the diagonal elements involve E and beta, which is uh, 1 or minus 1. So I have E plus M and E minus M on the diagonal. Sorry, I guess I subtracted them off. So I have E minus M and E plus M on the diagonal. And I had alpha dot P giving me the off diagonal elements
So that Dirac equation uh, boils down to a matrix equation uh, for the four component column vector uh, omega, which I can write in block, di in block form in terms of these two by two matrices uh, as I have written here. Okay. So all I've done here is uh, write out um, the, the Dirac equation for a plane wave basis. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's go ahead and investigate the solutions to this equation. Yes. Yes. Sorry, did I? Okay. Yeah. So, um, if it helps, uh, you could put an identity matrix here, the four by four identity matrix right there. Um, well, you know, what am I writing here? I'm just writing. What is that four by four matrix? That's E minus alpha dot P minus beta M. Where, um, so that's a four by four matrix, and I've written it out just plugging in these explicit expressions for alpha and beta. So let's investigate the solutions. Okay. Let's first consider the solution for a particle at rest. Okay. Just to understand a little bit better um, what uh, these solutions look like. So if P is equal to zero, then um, the equations say that E minus M acting on chi is equal to zero. So if chi is non-zero, that means that E is equal to M. Okay. That looks pretty good. Okay. That's just saying that if you have a particle at rest, E is equal to MC squared, because we're using units where C is equal to one. Now what about if P is non-zero? Let's write out that equation in a bit more detail. So the first equation here, coming from the top row of this matrix, says that chi is equal to sigma dot p divided by e minus m times phi. So that's just rewriting the top row of that equation for the 4 by 4 matrix, where here uh, chi and phi are 2 by 2 matrices, and sigma are two, are two component column vectors and sigma is the usual two by two poly matrix. And then the lower row of the equation just says that phi is equal to sigma dot p divided by e plus m times chi. So you could then go ahead and plug that second equation into the first equation and you see that chi is equal to sigma dot p squared divided by e plus m times e minus m, which is e squared uh, minus, p minus m squared times chi. And then using the fact that sigma dot p squared is equal to just p squared. So here, remember, p is just a number it's the momentum of the plane wave uh, that we're considering. I maybe should have used a different notation. I could have called it k to emphasize the fact that it's a number rather than an operator. But since uh, if you just take um, the Pauli matrix dotted into a vector and you square it, you get the norm of that vector. Um, this equation. No, here I'm just taking this equation and I'm plugging it into that equation. Okay. So that this equation says that chi is equal to p squared over e squared minus m squared times chi. Okay. And since chi is equal to chi, assuming that chi is non-zero, this means that p squared divided by e squared minus m squared is equal to zero. Or e squared is equal to m squared plus p squared. 
And this is just the usual relativistic dispersion relation that gives you the energy of an object in special relativity with rest mass m and momentum p. Okay. So that's good. Indeed, we constructed the uh, Dirac equation precisely so that um, we could make sense of particles uh, with energies that are given by the relativistic expression for energy. Okay. But if you stare at this equation for a minute, you'll start to get confused because E then can be the square root of this. And in particular, there's no reason why you couldn't choose the negative square root instead of the positive square root. So what does that mean? It means that the Dirac equation has negative energy solutions and in particular it has solutions with arbitrarily low energy. Um, this is very different from uh, the plane wave solutions of the regular non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, which where all plane waves have positive energy. Okay. Now, if the energies that we were finding here were negative, but they were still bounded below, if there was still an absolute uh, minimum energy below which you couldn't get, then that would be okay, because you never measure uh, the overall energy of a system, only relative energies. So you could just redefine what you mean by energy by adding a constant. The real problem here is that we have energies that can become arbitrarily negative. Okay. That uh, seems problematic. Okay. Unless you're Dirac. Okay. So Dirac was a very smart guy. Okay. So Dirac's resolution was the following. I mean, this is really, this is good stuff here. Dirac's resolution was the following. He said, well, what we're describing here are electrons. Electrons are fermions. And because they're fermions, they obey, obey the Pauli exclusion principle. In particular, it's impossible for any two of the particles that we're describing to occupy the same state at the same time. So we have an infinite number of negative energy levels. Let's just fill them up. So he said, let's just fill up the negative energy levels. So in particular, if you think about the spectrum of possible energies, then all possible energies are allowed, but all of the ones with negative energy are all filled up. So there are particles there, there are electrons there, and this set of infinite, an infinite number of uh, negative energy levels that are all occupied by these uh, electrons, which are fermions, is known as the Dirac C. So what Dirac proposed based on this is that what we usually think of as a vacuum or empty space is actually a state where we have an infinite number of particles present, okay, they're just filling up all of these negative energy levels. So in particular, usually you think of a vacuum as a very simple thing, a state where nothing is there. But we're seeing now in special relativity 
that the vacuum state, the state where nothing is there, is actually quite complicated. And in particular, in order to have a sensible interpretation of this equation, there need to be an infinite number of particles present in the vacuum, but they're the negative energy states of the system. And this um, is then uh, where the real beauty of uh, this theory becomes apparent. Okay. So let's imagine that we have uh, this uh, system in the state where all of the negative energy uh, levels are filled up and none of the positive energy uh, levels are filled up. Okay. Then that's what we think of as a state where there's nothing present. Okay. So then let's imagine that something happens. Let's imagine that there is some sort of interaction, let's say I shine a photon on the system, uh, that causes an electron to hop from one of these filled states with negative energy to a state with positive energy. Okay. If we were talking about a hydrogen atom here or some sort of uh, atom with many filled levels uh, and unfilled levels above the valence uh, state, then if you shine light on it, uh, that would cause one of the electrons to hop from one of the, unf the filled states to an unfilled state. So you could certainly imagine the same thing happening here. So the question th then is how do we interpret the case where an interaction causes one of these particles, let's call it a negative energy state, To, to hop up to some higher, sta higher energy state. And in particular, because all of the other negative energy states are filled, this would have to be a state with positive energy. So in particular, you imagine um, that you have, say, all of these states in Dirac C, and then there's some sort of interaction, and you would end up with some sort of gap in the Dirac C and some sort of state with positive energy. Okay. So the state down here has hopped up there. And here I'm drawing for you the energy spectrum. Well. The first thing that you have is you have an electron with positive energy. Okay. So this is an electron with positive energy. But you also have a hole. Okay. In the Dirac C. So if you had this hole in the Dirac C sitting here, it's an absence of a particle with negative, char negative energy. And if you have the absence of a state with negative energy, that's the same thing as having positive energy. And so this hole in the Dirac C is the absence of a negative energy state So in particular, if you have a hole in the Dirac C, you'll interpret that as something with positive energy. And likewise, if an electron has negative charge, then the hole is the absence of something with negative charge which is positive charge. And in particular, the hole in the Dirac C will behave in every respect exactly like a particle, just like the electron does. And so Dirac said, well, let's give a name to this particle. Let's call it the positron. And in particular, Dirac predicted, based on uh, his construction of this equation, that um, for every particle, there is a corresponding antiparticle
with the opposite charge of the corresponding particle that in his equation is described by a hole or an absence of a negative energy state in the Dirac C. So remember that we started our discussion of relativistic quantum mechanics with a set of arguments telling us that it was impossible to describe a theory of relativistic quantum mechanics without allowing for the creation and destruction of particles. And you can see now that Dirac's equation, although it looks a lot like a normal uh, Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, actually does very cleverly allow for the creation and destruction of particles. In particular, you don't, you think of the state with no particles as a state where all of the negative energy levels are filled. And you can create particles by popping some of these negative energy states into the higher, higher energy states, which causes an electron to pop into existence, but at the same time also requires a positron, i.e. a hole in the Dirac C, also to pop into existence. So um, this is a very explicit and beautiful example of a very simple quantum mechanical system, relatively simple quantum mechanical system, where you can have the creation and destruction of particles. And you can see, I mean, just charge conservation would tell you that you couldn't create a positive charged particle without also creating a negatively charged particle um, at the same time so that uh, overall charge is conserved. Um, so in particular, um, this theory allows for, and uh, not just allows for, but it requires the creation and destruction of particles. I mean, I think um, Dirac's prediction of the existence of the positron is really one of those triumphs of physics where um, he started out just using a few core principles, the basic core principles of quantum mechanics and of special relativity, and he tried to construct a theory that was consistent with those principles, and he uh, found that this theory uh, had a remarkable consequence. I mean, uh, you know, um, the idea that the vacuum state of nature, the, the state that we perceive as having no particles, is actually an infinite soup of negative energy particles, uh, was a radical one. But it's one that um, he followed through to its natural conclusion. Um, and it led to his prediction of the existence of the positron uh, uh, many years, uh, several years before it was actually observed experimentally. Um, I think it's one of the real triumphs uh, of uh, physical reasoning. Um, so uh, maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions. Yes? So all these electrons have mass, Yes. Charge. Yes. Well, um, well, let's put it this way. Um, they have energy, okay? um, and, uh, but there are an infinite number of states with negative energy. Um, but um, the way that we define energy, we don't actually care about anything but relative energy. Okay? So when you go through this transition from the uh, uh, sort of Dirac C at rest, to the Dirac C with one negative energy state moved up to positive energy. We only care about the relative energy. And you can see that the relative energy, well, it's twice the distance, but this distance here, okay. Um, uh, and we attribute half of that energy is coming from the electron and half is coming from the positron. And, um, yeah. Now, um, I should say that um, there are also some undesirable features of Dirac's model and that um, Dirac's uh, model of elementary particles is filling up this Dirac C is um, you know, not, I think, something that we really think of as the correct model um, at the end of the day in quantum field theory. 
Um, but I think it's a very good way of thinking about a quantum system where particles can be created and destroyed. Um, yeah, I mean, it has some undesirable features, I think, uh, that we would really have to delve into quantum field theory in more detail uh, to talk about. Um, but I think it, it, you know, it's a pretty, a pretty remarkable model of um, electrons uh, and positrons. Um, you know, um, a model like this wouldn't work for bosons, for example. Um, and we know there are bosons in nature, it's photons. Okay. And so if you want to try and understand uh, the creation and destruction of photons, then you would have to take a very different route. Okay. Um, so I think that, you know, most of the matter, matter is made up of fermions. Okay. So um, this sort of model will work for a lot of different uh, systems. Um, this is also a very, by the way, um, precisely the same model that we use to describe um, materials physics. So um, when you talk about a metal, um, what is a metal? A metal is a um, system, a lattice of atoms, where you have a lot of free electrons. Okay, They'll fill up all the um, states below some energy, uh, below some critical energy known as the Fermi energy or the Fermi surface. Um, and if you want to describe the excitations of that system, then you could pop one of these uh, states below the critical energy up uh, above the critical energy, and you would have a particle in a hole, just like in the Dirac equation. Okay. So when you describe, for example, um, uh, properties of metals, um, you would use precisely this, uh, this way of thinking about it. Now, you, didn't, uh, you wouldn't get it from the Dirac equation, but instead for, from some other um, model of what uh, your metal would look like. Um, but the idea of the Dirac C, um, of the ground state, the rest energy state of a metal as having a lot of electrons that are all filling up up to some level um, is just as valid uh, for a metal as it is um, for Dirac's model. Yeah. But in the case of metal, do you actually have electrons in the, in the potential of the atom right here? Well, well, the point about a metal, the point about a metal is that um, the electrons are not individually bound to the atoms, but they're free to move around. Okay. What is the, def the definition of a metal is something where it's a conductor, meaning that charge can move around freely. Okay. Meaning that the electrons are not bound to sit right next to the pr any individual proton. So um, really what a metal looks like actually is that you have um, some of the electrons are bound to, the pro bound to nuclei, um, but not all of them. And some of them are free to propagate around. That's why a metal is a conductor. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the problems with this model is that uh, the vacuum is a c very good conductor, okay. um, which may or may not, you know, depending on the system you want to describe, may or not be actually uh, correct. Okay. Um, I'll spend the rest of this class describing the interactions of this thing with electromagnetism. And we'll understand one other very remarkable consequence of this picture. Before I go on, though, yes? Well, um, what do you mean exactly by mass? OK. Um, well, what do you mean by mass? OK, is the question. OK. Um, in special relativity, mass is a number that you use to characterize an object okay, um, that is related to its energy. Okay, that's one way of characterizing it. And um, usually in relativity, you have system. So here, we're just constructing um, something uh, which, where we're trying to describe particles with positive energy and, po posi and we're finding out that um, there are states with negative energy as well. Okay. Um, but whether you would call them, I mean, it really, whether you call it positive mass or negative mass is kind of a, a semantic distinction. Um, mass here is a number that we use to characterize uh, these objects. Okay. What you should really talk about is the energy of the state that you're considering. Okay. And um, if it helps you think about it a little more uh, intuitively, you could imagine that instead we're talking about a metal, and so there's an absolute lower bound on the spectrum there. Okay. If that makes you feel more comfortable, uh, then you're welcome to think about it that way. Um, 
uh, so that you're, there aren't states with arbitrary negative energy, but just negative energy going down to some, some finite negative value. But we don't care about the overall normalization of the energy. We only care about differences in energies. So the fact that it's negative you know, shouldn't bother you. Um, yeah. Question. Okay, good. Okay. So there's one case where we do care about the overall normalization of the energy, and that's in gravity. Okay. Um, so whenever we say that, uh, for example, you can always shift the energy by a constant and it doesn't matter, we're ignoring gravity because energy is the same as mass, and mass gravitates. Okay. So um, the one case where you do have to worry about the overall normalization of the energy is when you think about gravity. Um, and this is, gets into a very, very uh, interesting but kind of delicate story um, because um, we're talking about a theory of relativity, okay? So you need to have the relativistic description of, of gravitation, namely general relativity. And so when you try and describe quantum mechanics and general relativity at the same time, uh, life gets very complicated. Okay. So, um, in particular, um, you're totally correct that you worry about um, the gravitational effect of these sorts of states. So, um, there are effects that are observable in gravity that are just not observable anywhere else, namely the zero point energy, okay, where you put the zero of energy. Um, indeed, uh, as I mentioned, you know, in uh, more realistic, in more uh, realistic descriptions of, of uh, relativistic particles, we actually don't think about it in terms of a Dirac C. Um, we think about it instead in terms of the quantum field theory, the scalar quantum field theory, for example, that we developed uh, last week. Um, and in that case, you don't worry about the gravitation of all these negative energy states per se, um, but there still can be contributions to the energy of the vacuum coming from these quantum fields. Okay. And in particular, you can do a rough order of magnitude estimate of the energy of uh, all of the various quantum fields that we have in nature due to the standard model, the elementary particles, stuff like that. And um, if you do that estimate, you'll find that it would have uh, so much energy um, that the universe should expand um, should double in, it would cause the universe to inflate so rapidly that it would uh, double in size every uh, Planck time, which is 10 to the minus however many seconds, 10 to the minus 30 seconds, something like that. Um, so obviously that's not the case. Um, nobody really understands why it's not the case. Um, it goes, on, this problem goes under the name of what's called the cosmological constant problem. Um, it's one of the great mysteries in theoretical physics. Okay. Why, and in experimental physics for that matter, because the cosmological constant has been observed. Okay. Um, you know, uh, it's, this is the, what's known as dark energy. Um, it makes up 75% of the energy density of the universe, um, and nobody quite understands. And quantum mechanically, the theory of the cosmological constant is very hard to understand. Um, uh, so, I suppose um, this is one of those cases where, you know, in your lifetime, uh, it may well be figured out. Or it may not be figured out. I mean, who the hell knows? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Good, good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, I'd now like to go ahead and delve into the Dirac equation in a bit more detail by asking how do these electrons described by the Dirac equation interact with uh, the electromagnetic field. Electrons carry charge, so they should um, interact with the electromagnetic field. And if you wish to describe a particle moving in an electromagnetic field, 
then the simple way to do so is if you want to describe the Hamiltonian of an object moving in some uh, magnetic field, for example, all you do is you take the Hamiltonian and you replace the momentum with the momentum minus Q over C times the, um, um, the vector potential A uh, describing that magnetic field. So, for example, the Dirac equation for an electron in an electromagnetic field is given by the usual Dirac equation, so I h bar psi dot, is equal to, well, C alpha dot P, but now it would be P minus Q over C times A plus beta mc squared, uh, A here being the vector potential. And as with a scalar particle, um, in the usual non-relativistic quantum mechanics, one could also include a, a scalar potential phi, a vector potential phi, if we had an electric field in addition to a um, magnetic field. So phi is the usual electrostatic potential or scalar potential. So are you guys all familiar with the fact that you just take P to P minus Q over C times A to put a particle, to describe the Hamiltonian of a particle in a magnetic field? So for example, um, um, if you describe a free particle with charge in the non-relativistic um, Schrodinger equation, the Hamiltonian is not uh, P squared over 2M, but P minus Q over C times A squared over 2M. I assume you guys have seen that. Is that correct? Okay. No? Yeah, have you not seen that? Well, if you haven't seen it, you're seeing it now. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, there are a variety of ways of understanding why it is, but it's just simply um, what we mean when we say uh, a charge. One way of saying it is that this is what we mean when we say a charged particle, that it couples uh, to the electric ma electromagnetic field uh, in this way. So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time investigating the solutions of this equation um, when we consider the case where we just have a magnetic field. Okay. So the, ve the scalar potential phi will be set equal to zero. And uh, let's investigate solutions in this case. So to make my life a little bit simpler, let me, I'll just rewrite, I'll just introduce a notation where I'll let pi be p minus q over c times a. And then I'll rewrite my Dirac equation for an electron moving in a magnetic field. So again, our solutions will be given by this column vector, four component column vector, times some phase. And as before, here, I'll put back in my uh, C squareds. Chi is proportional to some matrix times phi, and phi is proportional to some matrix times chi. And all I'm doing here is I'm just rewriting the equations that we wrote down above. Let's go take a look at them. So all I'm doing is I'm rewriting these, equation, these two equations here just with p replaced by pi. Okay. And I've restored my factors of c um, just because it'll make the result that I'm going to derive in a minute look more impressive. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to try and understand the non-relativistic limit. Okay. 
And we'll see um, in a few minutes that, in fact, when we investigate the non-relativistic limit of the Dirac equation, describing an electron moving in a magnetic field, we'll discover a very remarkable consequence. Okay. One which will explain uh, some things that you learned, uh, uh, that you've learned over your uh, lives as quantum mechanics um, that um, had previously just been presented to you uh, as facts, but now we'll see that they're actually consequences of the Dirac equation. So in the non-relativistic limit, the energy of a system should, the energy of an electron should be very close to mc squared. So I'll write it as mc squared plus epsilon, where epsilon is going to be the energy appearing in the Schrodinger equation. So it's 1 over 2 mp squared plus corrections that will be very, very small in the non-relativistic limit. Then I can rewrite the Dirac equation. So as chi, just rewriting this equation here and using e as mc squared plus epsilon, as 1 over epsilon times c sigma dot pi phi, and plus phi is going to be equal to c sigma dot pi divided by 2mc squared times chi, where I'm neglecting here subleading terms uh, that vanish when uh, epsilon goes to 0. So I'm keeping here only the leading terms in the non-relativistic limit, where epsilon is very small. So putting these two together, we see that epsilon chi is equal to c times sigma dot pi phi, which is equal, plugging in to this second expression, we have uh, c a factor of c squared, which cancels the c squared in the denominator, sigma dot pi squared over 2m times chi. So let's understand that uh, expression a little bit better. Okay. So first, I remind you that pi is equal to p minus q over c times a. And so what we need to do is understand what sigma dot pi is. So you might think that this is just the square of the vector pi. Okay. That's the identity that I used for you uh, earlier on in this class. But in fact, when I used that identity, I was secretly making an assumption um, uh, which um, I'd like to now uh, uh, investigate in a little bit more detail. Okay. So the first thing that I'd like to mention is that one nice way of writing out the uh, um, algebra obeyed by the Pauli matrices. So remember Pauli matrices have some nice algebra. Their anti-commutator is 0 or 1. Um, they're commutate, they commute with one another to give you the um, rotation algebra. And one convenient way of rewriting that um, is just to say that sigma dot a vector a times sigma dot a vector b is the dot product of the two vectors plus i sigma dotted into their cross product. Okay. So that expression is nothing more and nothing less uh, than the Pauli matrix algebra uh, rewritten uh, in a slightly different language. And so you might think that sigma dot pi is just equal to pi squared since pi cross pi is equal to zero since the cross product of any vector with itself is equal to zero. Um, but you would be wrong, okay? Because the cross product of a vector with itself is equal to zero if that vector is made up of numbers. But here pi is a vector that's a set of three operators instead of three numbers. So let's just look a little bit more carefully at what the cross product 
of pi with itself is. Okay. What is that? That's epsilon i uh, j k. Let me write it like this: epsilon i j k times p j minus q over c a j times p k minus q over c a k. And if this guy commuted with this guy, then you would see that this, then you would conclude that this is equal to zero. But it doesn't quite, uh, these two terms don't quite commute with one another because the comp A is a function of X and X doesn't commute with P. So instead, what you get is a term involving the commutator. So the commutator of P with X has an IH bar and we have that Q over C and then we have the comp epsilon ijk and we have a commutator of pj with ak which is the derivative with respect to j of ak so the derivative with respect to xj of ak minus the derivative with respect to k of aj okay. and if you remember what the magnetic field is in terms of the vector potential it's um, the curl of the vector potential. And another name for the curl is that it's epsilon ijk djak minus dkaj. That's the definition of the curl. So that's i h bar q over c times the magnetic field b. So what that means is that the non-relativistic limit of our Dirac equation so epsilon chi is, let me just rewrite it down. So there it is up at the top of the page. So it's um, sigma dot pi squared over 2m times chi. So let's just rewrite that using uh, pi here and this formula there. What is that? That's the square of p minus q over c a divided by 2m acting on chi plus the second term here which so there's an i here that ki that kills the i here gives you a minus sign so minus what do we get h bar q over 2cm from that uh, 1 over 2m here times sigma dot b. So there's that sigma and that b here, all times chi. So let's just step back a little bit and stare at this equation for a minute. So what is this? This is the non, this is the non-relativistic limit of the Dirac equation describing the interaction of an electron with the magnetic field. And what do we see here? Well, we see that there are two terms. The first is the usual term for a particle moving in a magnetic field. That's just the Hamiltonian of a particle moving in a magnetic field. And what is this? This is the interaction of the magnetic field with the spin of the particle. So one of the things that you probably first saw when you were discussing the theory of spin in quantum mechanics is that if you have a particle with spin interacting with the magnetic field, then the Schrodinger equation has a term sigma dot b. And that was just presented to you as um, a fact about nature. But here we're seeing that, in fact, it's a consequence of special relativity. And indeed, the Dirac equation predicts a specific coupling of spin to magnetic field. That coefficient here, 
Okay, I included my h bars and c's so that coefficient would look more impressive. That coefficient here is a prediction of the Dirac equation. And um, that coefficient is called the magnetic moment of the electron. So for a typical spin system, the Hamiltonian is the magnetic moment, well, there's a conventional minus sign, but it's the magnetic moment dotted in with the um, magnetic field. Okay. That's the interaction, the Hamiltonian, describing how a magnetic, uh, like a little dipole, a little, uh, or a little current loop with a magnetic moment would interact with a uh, magnetic field. And we're seeing that Dirac's equation gives you a specific prediction for the magnetic moment of an electron. And in particular, this reveals a little bit ex what the structure of an electron is. So in particular, we typically uh, parameterize the magnetic moment of an object as follows. So the magnetic moment of, let's imagine that we have some sort of charged object. Like, let's say that you have a conductor that's charged, okay, and you start spinning it. Then, typically, it'll have a magnetic moment. And usually, the way that we would parameterize that magnetic moment is that the magnetic moment would be proportional to the angular momentum of your conductor that you're spinning. And we'll typically parameterize it in terms of some unknown constant g, which is sometimes referred to as the Lande g factor, L-A-N-D-E uh, g factor. Or for spin one half particle, since j is h bar over two times the Pauli matrix, this is g times q h bar over four mc times sigma dot b. And the reason why these various normalization constants are introduced in our definition of the Lande g factor is that for a charged sphere, g is equal to 1. So if you have a sphere with a constant charge density and you spin it with some angular momentum, it'll have a magnetic moment. And it's Hamiltonian. Uh, describing the interaction of the magnetic moment with the magnetic field, mu dot b, is proportional to the angular momentum dot b, because the magnetic moment's proportional to the angular momentum, with a, a specific constant of proportionality. And what we see here is that special relativity implies that an electron is a spin one half particle, but not with uh, the standard uh, magnetic moment of a charged sphere, but one with g equals to two. If you compare this formula here, this coefficient here, to this coefficient here, you'll see they differ by a factor of two, so that the um, magnetic moment of an electron is in fact twice what you would expect if it were just a rotating charged sphere. Okay. And indeed, um, this uh, was actually observed um, before it was uh, understood theoretically. And the description of, and the um, uh, result that I have derived here was indeed one of the most uh, successful, was the, one of the first and most striking uh, pieces of evidence in favor of uh, the Dirac equation. Okay. I should maybe just uh, close with a bit of a um, historical note, which is that we've described here um, the, the magnetic moment of an electron 
um, computed using the Dirac equation for a free particle. And the description of, uh, and the result that this Landé g factor is equal to two, this is the description of what's called the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, uh, is indeed one of the most famous, um, uh, one of the most famous uh, things uh, discovered in particle physics in the early part of the 20th century. But in fact, the anomalous, ma the magnetic moment of the electron uh, can be uh, measured to a huge degree of accuracy. Um, so experimentally, um, G has been measured. So I'll just write down the first few digits here. Okay. So plus or minus uh, 15 in the last few digits. And um, you, just by describing corrections to the Dirac equation coming from quantum mechanics, coming from interactions with the electromagnetic field, uh, one can actually compute corrections to the Dirac, Dirac equation by using uh, perturbation theory. And um, I'll just write out the first few terms here. Okay. Um, so in fact, um, the uh, theoretical and experimental um, predictions of uh, this anomalous magnetic moment of the electron uh, match to a part in 10 to the minus 12. Okay. It's, uh, I think this is, um, can be fairly characterized as uh, the greatest match between theory and experiment in the history of physics. Okay. Um, there are very uh, few examples where people have been able to come up with uh, a theoretical prediction to 12 significant di digits that can be checked experimentally. Um, a funny historical aside is that actually the um, theory, uh, you'll notice that the error bars on the theoretical prediction are larger than the experimental error bars. That's because the integrals are so difficult. Well, there are a couple different sources of theoretical error. But the integrals that one has to do in order to evaluate perturbation theory, I think at fifth or sixth order, are so difficult that they can only be done um, numerically. Um, and so this is the numeric, this error, one of the primary sources of error here is the errors in numerical integration of uh, whatever, you know, it's some 15 dimensional integral that one needs to do. And several hundred of them, one assumes. I don't actually remember off the top of my head. Um, so I think that's probably an appropriate place for us to close our discussion of relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, I guess I have one or two minutes. Let me see if there are any questions. So I have a question for you. Um, so this concludes um, everything that I plan to say in this course. Okay. Um, we have one more lecture left on Friday. Um, and I'm giving out the exam on Sunday. So in fact, there's a set of exam practice problems for you to pick up uh, if you want. I mean, you don't have to do them, but they're fun problems. Um, would you like uh, me to cancel class on Friday? Um, I could. Um, I could also give another lecture on something. Um, I could do quantum information theory. I could do black holes and black hole quantum mechanics. I could do something else. Um, but if I'm going to give an extra special free lecture on Friday, you all have to come. Because if I'm going to spend however many hours it takes me to prepare a new lecture, uh, you guys better damn well uh, show up. Okay. Um, so who would prefer to not have class on Friday? Uh, it's okay. You can, you can, there's no need to be shy. We could either cancel class on Friday or I could give a lecture on something. How many people would prefer a lecture on something? It's too bad. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll, how many people would prefer to, okay. Uh, how many people would prefer to, to not have class? Okay. Okay, I guess I'll give a lecture. Would you prefer quantum information theory or you would like quantum information theory? Okay, I'll see what I can come up with. It might not be a full hour. Yeah, no, I'm sure I can talk for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll see you on Friday then. <laughs>